Would you all please stand for uh, the uh, reading of the word? Uh, I'm be reading from Revelation 5 verses 11 through 13. Revelation 5:11. Um, then I looked and I heard the voices of many angels around the throne and the living creatures and the elders and the number of them was myriads and myriads and thousands and thousands saying with a loud voice would you read this with me here worthy is the lamb that was slaughtered to receive power wealth wisdom might honor glory and blessing amen one more time it's says, saying with a loud voice let's do one more time please worthy is the lamb that was slaughtered to receive power, wealth, wisdom, might, honor, glory, and blessing. Amen. And I heard every crea created thing, every created thing which is in heaven or on the earth or under the earth or on the sea and all the things in them saying, read this last one with me too, please. To him who sits on the throne and to the Lamb be the blessing, the honor, the glory, and the dominion forever and ever. Amen. Thank you. sin and darkness whose love is mighty and so much stronger the king of glory the king above all kings who shakes the whole earth with holy thunder who leaves us breathless in awe and wonder the king of Yeah. 
atone for all that you've done for me. Thank you, Lord. Thank you, Lord. Thank you. Praise you. Yes, Lord. Thank you, Lord. Praise you.
want to see you. I want to see you. Open the eyes of my heart, Lord. Open the eyes of my heart. I want to see you. I want to see you. To see you high and lift it up. Shining in the light of your glory. Pour out your power and love as we sing. Holy, holy, holy. To see you high and lift it up. Shining in the light of your glory. Pour out your power and love as we sing.
hands up, never run out on me. Your love never fails and never gives up, and never runs out on me. Your love never fails and never gives up, never runs out on me. Your love. pray together. Father, how amazing your love is for us. There's a place in scripture that tells us that our lives are hidden in Christ, in God. I was reading just this morning, the author was talking about how God has grasped us in the middle of his hand. There's nothing that can touch us because his love envelops us. The author said, not even the devil could go and tear apart heaven, knock God off his throne and rip the son from the father and scatter all of his children. That could never happen. It's all because your love is always there. Your love remains for us and in us and with us. And we know that to be true, Lord, as we, not long from now, will be celebrating another Christmas. The reminder that your love was given to us in extreme measure by that baby in the manger. We thank you for our our Lord Jesus. There's no one like him. We adore him. We come tonight, Lord, asking that you would teach us once again from your word. When Jesus left, he sent the Spirit to live inside of us so that you would always be with us. So teach us tonight, Lord, what it is you have for us. Bring glory to your name and blessing to your people. We pray in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. Thank you, worship team. Copy mentioned it earlier, but um, just a reminder that we're still taking Thanksgiving offering. We'll we'll take that all the way through to the end of the the calendar year. And um, so if you didn't get a chance last week to give, um, please make sure you do. Also, Speaking of keeping our financial houses in order, uh, don't forget there's a brochure out there on the table and there's also a sign-up sheet out there. Uh, A number of weeks ago, we had a financial seminar here with our brother Darren. Welcome back, Darren. And uh, it's a great seminar, excellent information, really does help you get your financial house in order. uh, But you need the link in order to be able to capture that. We're very happy to give you the link. You can go and, and get it and uh, check it out on YouTube. Um, but you need the, basically the link is the password to get into that. So uh, make sure that you put your name on that list out there. Um, write yourself a note if you need to. And make sure you do that because very shortly we're going to send those out so that everybody can get it that, that needs, to, needs to have it. But we're blessed for that, uh, that seminar in our midst. This is the last week in the series of the Blessings of Giving. And I'm, I'm sure that it's, it's true that, uh, that I, I'm sure every one of us has heard this phrase before, that it's more blessed to give than it is to receive. And uh, in reality, it's, it is a biblical phrase, though interestingly enough, we don't find it coming out of the mouth of Jesus in any of the Gospels. If you notice where it comes from, it comes from the book of Acts. Paul was uh, saying farewell to the elders in the church at Ephesus. And, uh, and he, he wanted to remind them of how it was that he conducted his ministry among them. So listen to what he said. He said, I have coveted no one's silver or gold or clothes. And he had to say that because many people were accusing him of that very thing. In other words, he was in it for himself. He was, he was working and doing all these wonderful things ministry-wise, but just to give himself more and more. Um, he goes on and he says, you yourselves know that these hands ministered to my own needs and to the men who were with me. 
In everything I showed you that by working hard in this manner, you must help the weak and remember the words of the Lord Jesus that he himself said, it is more blessed to give than to receive. So that's Acts 20. There's, there's Paul saying, in the words of Jesus. And like I said, you can look through all the gospels that you want. You'll never find that phrase coming from the you know, lips of Jesus. It won't be highlighted red in your red edition, uh, you know, red letter edition of the scriptures. Um, and that's okay because the apostle John ended his gospel by saying this. He said, and there are also many other things which Jesus did which if they were written in detail, I suppose that even the world itself would not contain the books that would be written. That's John 21, 25. Basically what he's saying is, hey, you know what? Uh, these gospel accounts, these gospel accounts tell you much of what Jesus said and did, but they don't tell you everything. There was a lot more that Jesus said. There's a lot more that Jesus did. And if you were to try to write it down, uh, there wouldn't be enough books and space in the world to keep it all there. Um, so there are those times where yeah, we don't see, see everything that we might think is there, but this is a perfect case, though. The Holy Spirit, you know, gave, uh, gave Paul the understanding that Jesus did, in fact, say, it is more blessed to give than to receive. So we've heard that phrase. But the real question that underlies that, that concept that is there is, you know, really, what are the blessings that the person who gives receives? What, what are the blessings that we get when we give. And honestly, for centuries, people have had a very difficult time maintaining really a clear understanding of what the Bible really is talking about when it's saying that it's more blessed to give than to receive. So what are these blessings that we get? And that's kind of what we want to look at tonight because there's been a lot of misunderstanding. Trust me, I'm going to show you a couple of examples here in a second. A lot of misunderstandings about what blessings we do actually get. And we're not clear about it. Uh, we don't even understand the blessings that, you know, the Lord gives to those who are generous, um, as he said that he's going to do. It's just a, an area of great confusion. Let me give you one example. Some people think, for instance, that if you give, you can, I'm going to get theological here for a second, that you can, you can gain remission of some of the temporal penalties of your sin. In other words, uh, if you give, you're, you can basically buy some, some taking away of some of the temporal penalties of your sin. It, it's really a predominant you know, idea in, in the teaching of the Catholic Church. In the Catholic Church, they have something that is called, it's a concept called the treasury of merit. And unless you were birthed in the, the Catholic Church or understand a little bit deeper theology in the Catholic Church, we wouldn't understand this. So let me give you just a brief background. The idea is really pretty simple. It's the idea that while Jesus was alive and in his death, he did a super abundance of good works. He did more good works than were necessary to get into heaven. And so the, the Catholic Church has taught for generations that, for instance, one drop of the blood of Jesus contained enough merit to save the entire world. And so the excess merit from all the blood that Christ shed, all that superabundance of merit was stored in what they have termed the treasury of merit. Some call it the treasury of the church. So to speak, it was kind of banked into that treasury all of that was put into that treasury. And other people along the, through the ages have contributed to that, that big account of blessing in the treasury of merit. Mary, the mother of Jesus, obviously contributed. All the saints have contributed merit to that. And so what, what we find is that all of this righteousness and all of these good works then are, are held in this treasury and according to Catholic teaching, um, all of those are placed under the charge of the Pope, who alone has the power to dispense these merits as he would see fit. And he often has done that in, in, in something called indulgences. So you might remember that word, indulgence. Uh, if you're familiar with church history at all, you think of the word indulgence and you think of Martin Luther, um, who was a Catholic, you might remember that he wasn't a great big fan of indulgences. Uh, he's, what he really wasn't a fan of was the, was the abuse of indulgences. The idea is that the Pope can allow people to obtain merit for themselves or someone else through a number of different means. 
And so the churches outline these means. So for instance, you can, you can obtain merit, some of this merit from the treasury, through praying. You can achieve merit through reciting the rosary. You can achieve merit through reading the scriptures. And of course, you can receive merit through giving. And so, um, here's one person said this, among the good works which might be encouraged by being made the condition of an indulgence, almsgiving would naturally hold a conspicuous place. To give money to God or to the poor is a praiseworthy act, and now watch this, and when it is done from the right motives, it will surely not go unrewarded. And so the idea is, if, if you have sinned, for instance, and you know that you, uh, you know, you've really messed up and, and uh, you know, there's a big penalty attached to what it was that you've done, uh, you can go to God through one of these means that has been, been outlined and you can buy some remission of some of the temporal penalties of your sin. And so if you're worried about that for yourself, you can do those things. You can give and get the remission then of some kind of uh, punishment for your sin. Or if you're worried about Uncle Tony who died, you know, a few weeks ago, and you know that he was really, a, you know, not always the best person, um, but you can't imagine how horrible it is for him to have to work off all of that. You can, you can buy an indulgence of one form or another, and you can get some remission of, you know, the, some of the penalty of his sin um, given to him through, through buying it. And so the problem was in, history, in history is that some of the popes really abused this idea. Uh, they, they took advantage of this and they, they used it as a vehicle to raise some enormous amounts of money for really very large building projects. So if you've ever gone to Europe, you see, see some of these magnificent, unbelievable, you know, in, incredible cathedrals that took hundreds of years to build. Well, the, many of the funds for some of those places was all done through indulgences. People were worried about their eternal condition, you know, their, the condition of a loved one, and so they'd, they'd buy an indulgence. And, and the way it works is really very simple. You pay for the indulgence, right? You get some remission from the punishment for your sin, and, and, and the church gets your money. And so really, uh, you know, the church was able to amass incredible fortune uh, by this particular method. Some officials, you know, kind of not the best examples in the church, were, were, were individuals who actually used indulgences to kind of line their own pockets. Uh, they, they would buy enormous amounts of land, have this enormous debt, and then they would go in, and this is where Martin Luther comes into the picture, they would go in and they'd start selling indulgences to people, uh, and the money was going into their pocket to pay for the land that they just bought. It was to, to cancel out their own personal financial debts. And, and so what we see is that an idea that, that somewhere throughout history, people have come to the idea that you can, can buy a spiritual blessing. That that's happens in the Catholic Church. Protestant churches aren't any better, friends. I mean, if you've never heard of it, you should understand the prosperity gospel that's so prevalent in, in uh, you know, Protestant churches. They, they don't give you a spiritual benefit. Um, they, they promise you a, a financial benefit. And so prosperity gospel preachers will often teach a principle. It's called the hundredfold principle of giving. So if you want a bigger house, if you want a fancier sports car, or you just need a little help on this month's rent or utilities, then just give. Give to God. Whatever you give to God, he will give back to you a hundredfold. And the idea is based on a, a misunderstanding of this verse. And it says, And everyone who has left houses or brothers or sisters or mother, father, wife, or children, or lands, for my sakes, for my name's sake, Jesus says, they shall receive a hundredfold and inherit eternal life. Of course, the misunderstanding is that that's not a promise for here and now. That's a promise for eternity. But many claim that that's for here and for now. And so some preachers will boldly tell you, just you, you have a need, then give to our ministry here. And, uh, you know, if you give 10 bucks, then you can expect a check this week in the mail for, you know, 100 bucks or what would be 1,000 bucks, <laughs> right? Or some other kind of benefit. Some say give so that you can gain healing. There's all kinds of permutations of this. 
And just to show you that this is not a rare occurrence, I hope you understand that, that if you've ever thought about it before, some of the biggest churches in our country, some of the biggest churches in Southern California, some of the biggest churches in the world are, are manned by prosperity teachers in the pulpits. I mean, t- literally tens of thousands of people just like you and just like me tomorrow morning are going to occupy a seat in an arena somewhere to hear the alluring message of prosperity theology. And we understand why, don't we? I mean, there's something very attractive of the idea that, hey, if you throw, you know, 10 bucks into the, <laughs> into the offering plate, you're going to get 1,000 bucks back. That's very, that's very alluring. I mean, who doesn't want to, to give and then have your cancer healed? Who, who, who doesn't want to, you know, give so that your marriage can be restored? You know, who, who doesn't want to give so that you can get some kind of blessing, some kind of benefit from God that way? Who doesn't want to give so that you can get rid of that pile of junk sitting in your driveway that you call your car so that you can get a, a full, paid off, you know, brand new, fully equipped Jaguar? I mean, who wouldn't want to do that? Well, thousands of people, and here's the sad part, Thousands and thousands and thousands of people, many of them, the statistics bear this out, many of them are some of the most hurting people economically and physically who are so in need of hope that they look for hope in all the wrong places. They look for hope in a prosperity gospel because it feels like hope, but I can guarantee you that it is false hope. It's really a dead end. It's, it's really a trap. And so if the truth is told, uh, this gospel that is preached like this is really, it's not the gospel of Jesus Christ. I mean, just think about, you know, one second, the idea that if if Jesus was really promising, you know, absolute amazing prosperity, then why was it that he lived in poverty? Did he not give enough? Here's what he said. He says, if anyone wishes to come after me, he must deny himself and take up his cross daily and follow me. That sounds a lot different, doesn't it? For whoever wishes to save his life will lose it. But whoever loses his life for my sake, he is the one who will save it. For what is a man profited if he gains the whole world and loses or forfeits himself? As they were going along the road, someone said to Jesus, I'll follow you wherever you go. And Jesus said to him, the foxes have holes and the birds of the air have nests, but the son of man has nowhere to lay his head. The point was, you say you'll follow me, but really, you want to follow me to the place where a stone is your pillow? Because that is my life. See, he's not promising prosperity. He actually promises difficulty, persecution. He does. And so, the problem is that the gospel that Jesus gave us is really not a gospel about coming, becoming rich in material things. It's not a gospel of guaranteeing you positions of power or influence. It doesn't promise you the luxuries of the world, but that doesn't make any difference because droves of people tomorrow morning are going to go to a church like that. Uh, so, so we have this misunderstanding. We have misunderstandings about what is it that God is going to give us, you know, when we give and, and there's lots of other misunderstandings. We don't have time to go through them all. Let me give you a couple other you know, ideas here. You, know, you realize, don't you, that in our capitalistic culture, we've been trained to always ask one simple question. What do I get out of the deal? What's in it for me? So we've been trained since we were little to be watching out for ourselves and ask ourselves, what am I, what am I gonna get out of this? If I'm gonna give all that, then what am I gonna get? We have a real big misunderstanding because we don't understand the terminology and so we forget it so quickly that what the Bible talks about is giving here actually accumulates treasure in eternity. It, it's not we give here and we get an enormous treasure, you know, just full of stuff here. It's a treasure in heaven that's being accumulated. We don't get that. We don't think about that. Another one is, I think sometimes in us, we have these ideas that float in our head and it's, it's hard to put away. The idea that, you know, we think that if we give, then God is obligated to give us something in return. I mean, we, we play that game sometimes. 
We think to ourselves, well, I did this good thing and that good thing and this good thing, and we get into a tough spot and we say, surely, God, those would account for you than to give me something now, right? That, that is really faulty thinking. It, 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 we, we can't put God into that position, I can guarantee you that. We, it's not a gumball God that we live, you know, live with. Put in your 25 cents and then get whatever the blessing is that you want. It doesn't work that way, not even close. So we have all of these misunderstandings. And the question that I have is, well, how did we get here? How did we get to the place where we don't understand what God promises to give to us when we give? And then that's really what we want to focus on tonight. My answer to that question is this. It's because we really have not taken a very close and careful, you know, studied look at what the scripture says we're going to get when we give. Because if we did that, we would then understand what it was that is the blessing for the person that gives. And that's what you're going to see tonight as we, we go on. The, the classic passage, maybe one of the most important passages that addresses this, is 2 Corinthians chapter 9. Here's a few, you know, scattered verses in one section. It says this. Now this I say, he who sows sparingly will also reap sparingly, and he who sows bountifully will also reap bountifully. And God is able to make all grace abound to you so that always having all sufficiency in everything, you may have an abundance for every good deed. Now he who supplies seed to the sower and bread for food will supply and multiply your seed for sowing and increase the harvest of your righteousness. You will be enriched in everything for all liberality, which through us is producing thanksgiving to God. One commentator said after you know, addressing this passage, he said, you know what the point of this passage is? The point is real simple. The point is that, that, that God will bless those who give. He will. And those who give are going to be blessed in two very particular ways. That's what we're going to look at. The, the first of those is this. They're blessed by the fact that their needs will be met and they will have an abundance to give even more. And the second is they will gain an increase in the, har increase in the harvest of their righteousness. Both of those you can see are in that passage that we just dealt with. So let, let's, let's think about those two blessings in a moment, but Paul, in, in writing this passage, begins with a very general principle. It, it's, it's an obvious principle, but it's powerful. The principle is this, in from 2 Corinthians 9, 6, it says, now this I say, he who sows sparingly will also reap sparingly, and he who sows bountifully will also reap bountifully. So it's the principle of sowing and reaping, Right? Uh, one commentator said this, I like this because of the agricultural, you know, image. He said, every farmer recognizes that the size of the harvest is directly proportionate to the amount of seed sown. The farmer so who sows his seed sparingly will reap a meager harvest. The one who sows bountifully will reap a great harvest. In the spiritual realm, the principle is that giving to God results in blessings from God. Generous givers will reap generous blessings from God, while those who hold back selfishly, fearing loss, will forfeit that gain. Now understand, this is not the prosperity gospel. It's not the prosperity gospel. Here's what one person said. They said that the, the, the reason that God gives back to those who give is not, as prosperity teachers falsely imply and exemplify, so that people can consume it on their own desires of faster cars, large homes, more lavish jewels. God supplies them so they will have an abundance for every good deed. It looks outward, not inward. The Lord will fully supply cheerful givers with what they need to use for what is a good work to the honor of the Lord. He constantly replenishes what they expend so the cycle of giving and ministering to others can continue. Generous givers are the people whose lives are most full of righteous deeds. It's an operational principle in the economy of God, this sowing and reaping idea. And so if you start there, then we begin thinking, well, what are those blessings? You know, what is this harvest that we're going to achieve? And so let's look at the first of those blessings. Here's how I put it there. Those who give generously, they will always have enough to meet their needs and more. They'll have even enough, an abundance, in fact, that enables them to give even more. You notice 
that this blessing is not about personal accumulation. This is not about us gaining this great treasury for ourselves. It's a promise that says your needs will be met and, and God's going to make sure you get even more than that because that gives you then the seed to sow, to give to others. That's how the principle works. And so it's a blessing for continued generosity in giving to others. And we, we talked a little bit about this last week. You know, God gives us the resources that we have. We thank him for those. We give others to meet the needs of others from those they give thanks. God is glorified. And as we've given, now he gives us more because we're on that track. So he gives us more. Our needs are met. We have an abundance to be able to give to, uh, to, to others. We give to others and God resupplies it. It's just this continuous circle of giving that God has established. This blessing then, this first blessing of having our needs met and then having an abundance is, is obvious in this passage that we've been looking at. So when you look at that, let, let, me, let me fast forward to one more slide. I'm going to break that into two parts. One part is that our needs will be met. The other part is that we'll have an abundance. And so if you take this passage, and let's just focus for a second on the fact that God will meet our needs. So look at the, those, those uh, sections that are highlighted in red there. It says, and God is able to make all grace abound to you so that what? Always having all sufficiency. That's what he's saying to you. God's going to make sure that you have all sufficiency for everything. And he goes on, in everything you may have an abundance for every good deed. We'll get there. He says, now, he who supplies seed to the sower and bread for food, seed for the sower, bread for food, those are your, those are your basic needs. So he's saying, God is going to supply your basic needs. That's what we're looking at. So he's going to give us sufficiency for all that we need. He's going to give us seed for sowing, bread for food. And then the next one, it says, and you will be enriched in everything, right? You have no needs. If you have everything, you don't have any needs. So you see how this passage is breaking out. There's one blessing that's kind of floating through here. It's the idea that, that one of the blessings of those who give is that God promises that their needs will be met. But it doesn't end there. Because the promise is not just that your needs will be met, it's that your needs will be met and you'll have even more, you'll have an abundance so that you can give it away. And look at that same passage. Now we highlight a couple of other different things. You know, he says, you may, so that you may have, he's gonna give you a sufficiency in everything so that you may have an abundance for every good deed. A good deed is external to you. He goes on to talk about, you know, you get the seed to sow and the bread for food will supply and multiply your seed for sowing, for giving it away. And then you go down to the last one, you know, you'll be enriched in everything. Why? For all liberality. He's talking about liberally, generously giving. And so if you look carefully at this passage, you understand that here's what happens to people that give. People that are generous, systematic givers, like the scripture talks about, their needs will be met. And more than their needs will be met, they'll have an abundance, not for themselves. It's not about us accumulating. We, we, we're going to have an abundance so that we can give even more away, and we just keep it going. And it just keeps going back and forth, back and forth, keeps going around and around. Here's what somebody said. God gives so freely and abundantly that his children will always have sufficiency in everything. In this context, that refers primarily to material resources because the harvest must be of the same nature as the seed. Having sown material wealth by their giving, believers will reap an abundant harvest of material blessing in return. God graciously replenishes what they give so that they lack nothing. He will also continuously provide the generous giver with the means of further expressing that generosity. You get the idea? This is not prosperity theology because it's not about us. It's not giving to get more from God so that we can get what we want after all. This is giving, and God then promises that we'll always have our needs met, and we'll have an abundance so that we can give more generously away. That's, that's what we get. That's what we get for giving. Now, there's a second one. The second blessing is this. Those who give will increase the harvest of their righteousness. In other words, 
they will grow spiritually. Listen to the Apostle Paul here in that same passage. Now, he who supplies seed to the sower and bread for food will supply and multiply your seed for sowing and increase the harvest of your righteousness. You want to know the people who are growing spiritually? They're the people who are generously giving. Because in the course of that giving, their spiritual lives are enlivened. It's, a, it, it, it's, it's one of those, th- those practices that, that causes our growth spiritually. The more generous we become, the more our generosity produces you know, spiritual growth. If we got practical about that, it produces more of the fruit of the Spirit in us. I think you'd agree with me. Galatians 5 talks about the fruit of the Spirit The fruit of the Spirit really is the outward demonstration of this change that's happening in our lives. So Paul writes there, you know, uh, the fruit of the Spirit is love, joy, peace, patience, kindness, goodness, faithfulness, gentleness, and self-control. The fruit of the Spirit, as you're walking with God, the fruit of the Spirit begins to be developed more and more. The harvest of your righteousness, the harvest of your fruit of the Spirit enlarges the more you give. Let me just show you a couple examples because we don't have time to go this, that far in this. But if you think about the fruit of the Spirit, think about the fruit of the Spirit and its relationship to giving. What's the first fruit of the Spirit? Love, right? So think about it. Isn't it true that the more you give to meet the needs of others, the more you are demonstrating the fruit of love? because we've defined love this way for years now. Love really is the meeting of the needs of another. And so every time you give to meet the need of another, what you're doing is you're expressing love. And so there's more and more and more fruit of love the more and more and more you give. What's the second fruit? Joy. Fruit of the Spirit is joy. So tell me, isn't it true that the more you give, the more you see the smiling faces of people whose needs have been met, the more joy rises in your own heart. I mean, we're getting close to Christmas, right? Is there anything more wonderful than watching your kids, you know, run to the Christmas tree on Christmas morning, they rip open the package, and there is the gift that they wanted all year long. And on their face is not a scowl. In fact, you probably won't see their face because they'll be jumping up and down and spinning around. Joy. And that joy makes us joyful, doesn't it? And so the more we give, the more joy becomes a product of our giving. Joy in the lives of others. Joy in our hearts as we see people's needs being met. And we, th- we thank God that we had the opportunity to, to use some of the resources he gave us to help meet their needs. It's a wonderful thing. It's a joyful thing. It's, a, it's an increase. The more we give, the more joy there is. It's an increase in our spiritual vitality, an increase in the harvest of our righteousness. Love, joy, peace. Think about it. It's the last one. The more we give, the more we discover that God is faithful to keep his promise of meeting our needs. He does. I mean, how many people struggle with stress and worry over finances? And it becomes this big, huge thing. It's a, it's, a, it's, a, it's a peace robber in our lives. We're so worried about all of our finances. Now, some of that may be because we've been really bad money managers. We didn't go to Darren's seminar. But, but it might also be because you know what? We're not giving. Because you know how this, this blessing works, right? How are your needs met? By you giving. Because it's when you give that God pours back in to you and promises that your needs will be met. And more than that, you'll have an abundance, not for you, but so you can give it to somebody else. And so what happens as you become a generous giver this way? What happens inside of your heart is the worry and the concern that you had over your finances diminishes and what happens and takes place instead? Peace. Peace rises because you begin to realize, oh, wow, he's there. God sees me. 
He's faithful. My needs are met. And I even have a little extra I can give away. Amazing, huh? Now, John, this is another book I'm going to write someday, okay? So, but anyway, you could go through all the fruit of the Spirit. Think about how does it equate to giving? It does. Because the promise is that it will increase the harvest of your righteousness. As our righteousness increases, we'll have more love, more joy, more peace, more patience, more kindness, goodness, faithfulness, gentleness, self-control. All of those things have a direct connection somewhere to giving. And so there's two particular ways that those who give get blessed. Their needs will be met. They'll have an abundance to give more. They'll gain an increase in the harvest of their righteousness. That's what we saw tonight. This, this is the last message, though, in that whole series called The Blessings of Giving. So let me just remind you what we've seen. We, we, we've seen four different blessings of giving. There are certain blessings that the recipient of giving receives, and their blessing is that their needs are met. There is blessings that the giver gets, and we saw those tonight. A few weeks ago, we saw that those who witness our generosity get a blessing. They, they see how great and how wonderful and how, how absolutely joyful it is to be, be giving. And so they see people who are generously giving to others. And when they see that and they see the joy in everybody's face, they say to themselves, I want a part of that. That's what I want. And so they're blessed by being moved into that, this whole process of God and how he works. And then finally, the fourth we've seen was that God was blessed. We saw that last week. When we give, God is blessed. How? By thanksgiving and by him receiving glory. And so we talked about how when he gives us the blessings that he gives us, we give him thanks. When we give to others, they give thanks probably to us, but they also give thanks to God that he saw their need and he met their need. And so God gets glory and praise that way. We talked about glory. So what does that mean? Well, part of it's that God is praised that's not all. The way that God is glorified in our giving is because we are demonstrating in our acts. And when people look at us, what they see is they see what God is like. Because our God is a generous God. Our God is a God who gives to his children. And the minute we begin to step into that and we start to give like God gives, sacrificially, generously, when we start doing that, People see us, what they're seeing really is a reflection of God in us. And he's glorified when his people act like he acts. In this case, generous giving. So we started last week our Thanksgiving offering. If you didn't have a chance last week, still opportunity, obviously, to the end of the month. Copy mentioned, go ahead and go online. You can, if you're giving online, and go to that tab. And there, there's a particular tab for Thanksgiving offering. Make sure you press that one then you fill in the amount of your gift. Or if you're giving physical gifts, the box is right back there on the back table. You can give there. Just make sure you put on the envelope that it's for Thanksgiving offering. Okay. Kirk, can you come? You know, I was, I was thinking as we were going to come to the communion table again, I don't think that the first disciples really knew all that they were going to get in God's gift of his son, Jesus. I just don't think they had the fullness of the picture. But I was thinking about how amazing it is that here we are at this point in history. We know all about the story of Jesus. We know, we know about his birth. We know about his sinless life. We, we know about his death and his burial and his resurrection. We know about his ascension. We, we know about his intercession now before the Father on our behalf. We know, the, we know all these things about Jesus. And we understand with greater clarity than the earliest disciples probably did that Jesus was coming. He was going to die for our sins. So I think we understand the blessings of the gift better than even the first disciples did. And th coming to this table is the perfect moment to say, here these elements are, they represent Jesus Christ, his body and his blood. And, and there's only one thing you can do in the face of the gift of the Son of God. <laughs> That's to do what Paul said. Thank God 
for his indescribable gift. And so do that tonight. Like usual, we're gonna go to one of the stations, grab one of the elements for yourself, go back to your table, spend a moment, you can pray, you can meditate, you can thank God for his indescribable gift of his son, Jesus Christ, partake of the elements, and then enjoy a couple of moments, and in just a few moments, I'll come back up and we'll close our service in prayer. So help yourself. Will you stand with me as we close? Father, I'm convinced that we have a, an understanding about all that Jesus was about, even more probably than the early disciples. We understand that you sent him to give his life for us, that in his blood we would have forgiveness of our sins. There'd be this great transfer that took place. Our sins go upon Christ and his righteousness comes upon us. And Lord, that makes the difference in eternity. Those of us who know Jesus Christ and have embraced him, we have eternal life because of the gift that you gave to us, the gift of your son. So we thank you and we praise you and we, we want to glorify you, Lord. We want to be like our Savior, be like you, the God who generously gave to us when we didn't deserve any of it. Praise your name. Thank you that you saw us, you knew our need, and you met it in Christ fully completely. We bless you, Lord. We love you. And we pray in Christ's name. Amen. Amen. Lord willing, we'll see you next week. We'll start talking about Christmas.